positions, including a six-term uh, Vancouver City Councilor, past Metro Vancouver Board Director, and he was also appointed uh, to the uh, he was also appointed to the first board of the Greater Vancouver Transportation Authority, now called TransLink, in 1999. He currently um, sits on the board of the Sightline Institute and the International Center for Sustainable Cities. And I'm very pleased that uh, Gord is able to be with us tonight. So we'll turn it over to Gord, and then we'll uh, continue on with the rest of our presenters. So pass this over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, LaPerla Palmer. <coughs> this is unique. I believe I'm to be followed by a roadshow of Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> distinctly U.S. Thank you to the councillors. I appreciate any politician who shows up. I know what it meant when I was on council. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of other things you could be doing and probably should be, but you're here, so thank you for that. And of course, to all of you. Now, I don't know that Daniel quite understood the risk he was taking when he invited me, because I'm actually not going to talk much about what he wants me to talk about. I think others are. I want to set some context here. I want to talk about some bigger issues. You know, bridges are so, so critical uh, in our lives. In the history of the city, uh, they are iconic in the true sense of the word. We all have a sense of what a bridge means to us. It's an intimate relationship to our built environment. You're crossing the water. For human beings, that's a big deal. And you can measure the progress, the growth of a region, literally, by the years that a bridge opens. In the history of Vancouver, three grandful bridges, each representing a different era. But when the bridges cross the Fraser, the Oak, I don't know the order, Oak, Knight, certainly the Port Man, what, 63? Yeah, 63. Anyone around for that? You of a certain age. What was that like? Big deal? Yeah. And not just because now you've had access to really the hinterland, the Fraser Valley, but for what it meant for this region was the opening up of the south of the Fraser. And for a city like mine, Vancouver, that was the tipping point. It was no longer the north of the Fraser that provided, within about a decade or so, the majority of the housing units. People very reasonably could expect that they could find the Canadian dream by going across that bridge. It, it sets the, our destiny. You can't talk about transportation without talking about land use, and those may be rather bloodless planners' terms. But what we're really talking about is our way of life, our values, our expectations, almost what we think is the natural order of things. So when it comes time to think about building another bridge, the implications are staggering. You are locking into place the future of how this region is going to be developed. So here we are, entertaining the prospect of another, basically, car-dependent piece of infrastructure. So let me pull that word apart. Right away with the qualification. I am not going to beat up on the car or the truck. Absolutely indispensable. Even if I could, I wouldn't remove them. They do important things that only cars and trucks can do. That's not the part of the word that counts. It's the dependent part. Now, car dependence, I think, is pretty straightforward. Can you imagine your life without a car? Is it practical? Can you get to work? Can you shop? Drop the kids off, pick them up. Is it pretty much indispensable for where you live and what you do? And as everybody expects reasonably that that's what you are going to do. Is your city designed on the expectation that almost everyone, almost all the time, for almost everything will drive? Because once the port and bridge is open, that's exactly what we did. That was designed with the very explicit intention of what would go on the other side would be car dependent, and it is. Now, it's not to say that Surrey isn't trying to create a different vision, and I hope we'll be successful at doing it, but there was absolutely no question that in 1963, when that bridge opened, that was what they were going to do. <laughs> on the other side of the bridge, on this side, that was a different world. 
It was the world of New Westminster, and New Westminster was a consequence of different kinds of technologies in different areas. So I don't have to tell you that. I mean, you probably know your history pretty well better than I, but the expectation was you wouldn't drive because the automobile at the time New Westminster was fundamentally shaped, laid out. No cars. So people very reasonably, practically, found other ways of doing it. And they had choices. They could walk, they could take a horse, they could take streetcar, they could turn urban. They had all kinds of different choices. And eventually, of course, and pretty quickly thereafter, the car. And it was all integrated into basically one way of living and moving around. And those of you in New Westminster are still very comfortable with that concept. Across the river, different set, different era, different expectations, different way of life. So that's kind of the setup. What Portman and Patello, because they are instantly linked and inextricably linked now, is really about the kind of region, the kind of life, the expectations of them. Okay, and the choices are huge. And so let me give break to it. The idea that the Transcend Port would have a vote in 2008 set the size of that bridge to six times, and then assume that that issue was settled was just wrong. And the first thing that we should do right at this point is get them to establish, truly, whether they're going to stick with that. It's worth having a good debate, and in fact, it's worth having a struggle about that. Because if that vote holds, if TransLink is not going to discuss what the other options are, what the other possibilities are, what the implications of this are, what they're saying is, we're going to build that thing with exactly the same expectations that we did in 1963 with the Port Man. We want to lock the next generation and what happens on both sides of the bridge into further car dependence. That's a pretty dumb thing to do at this point in human history because the risk is very much higher. I can understand 63. I wouldn't criticize the people who did that. That was the world. But to do it today in 2012 is breathtaking in the risk that's being assumed. I'm talking about really big risks. I'm talking about energy prices and volatility. I'm talking about climate change. But you don't have to do that. All you have to do is talk about the risk that we are putting people into in their day-to-day -day lives if we expect that they're going to be able to live and afford and do all the things that you need to do in contemporary life to make a living, to raise a family, to survive, to create the kind of community you want if it's all going to be done presumably in the car. That's a very high risk proposition, and it's not one that we can afford in the quite literal sense about our way of life. So the first thing up, that vote has to be revisited. Second thing up, what are the priorities? Now I know what they are, because I voted for some of them when I was on the Translate Board. But this is a really critical issue for New Westminster. And I would say, just as Translink has to revisit that motion about 2008 and a six-lane bridge in a certain place, leaving you guys to decide what color you want the railings painted, <laughs> New Westminster has to get serious about what I saw in its vision, and Jerry wants to address this. I went to the public hearing at the Justice Institute, and I read very carefully, quite explicitly, what you had in your planning process for what is a transportation master plan. And if I could, pardon me if I'm wrong, I think I remember the words exactly. Uh, oh, no, I don't. <laughs> you want to approach, how do you phrase it? Um, you want to take steps towards no increase in capacity or through traffic. What were the words again, Terry? You want to approach. We want to work towards. You want to work towards no. Adding no new net capacity. Having no new net capacity for our those are weasel words. <laughs> you got to decide whether you are going to actually do it, not whether you're going to approach it. It was looking back in the history of Vancouver, one of the great dividing points in the history of that city, when the councils in '72 to right to the about 2000, said explicitly, no more capacity for the single occupancy vehicle. We are not going to widen any roads. 
We're not going to build any more bridges. We'll put in a left hand turn bay occasionally. Safety is important that way. But our priorities are going to be walking and cycling and transit and goods movement and single occupancy vehicle. And hey, engineers, you don't get any more money to design more wide roads, bigger bridges. Not going to happen. And it turns out the councils across the ideological spectrum really meant what they said. And you can see it in the budget allocations. You can see it in what we chose not to build, what wasn't in our capital plans. And what that meant is we had to take those options, the other ones, if we were going to increase capacity for the single occupancy vehicle in the face of population growth. We have to take those other ones seriously. We really actually did have to have a transit system that would get people around. We had to take cycling and walking in particular seriously. That's the choices we were going to limit ourselves to. Now you can go back to about 1972 and date it from that point. And then you can look 40 years later to today, and you can make a judgment about whether that council was right or wrong, and what happened as a consequence. So what did happen in those 40 years? Oh, gee, we ended up with the world's most livable city. Our problem is it's too expensive. People want to come here. They bid up the value of the property. We keep getting more jobs downtown. We get more population. And we're seeing a drop in the number of vehicles moving. Now, this is hard to believe for people, but it's the data is absolutely clear. Since about the mid-90s, the number of moving vehicles has been dropping, coming into the city and coming into downtown. We know the numbers. And we now know when we set targets back in the 70s and the 90s and most recently that we passed them way ahead of what we expected. It's so counterintuitive, it's really hard to believe. But it's all based on that decision that we weren't going to expand capacity to the single occupancy vehicle. Not that, not the question whether we would approach trying to do that, or we'd think about it and maybe come back and answer that question. So if you guys are really serious about it, New Westminster, if you're really serious about it, you gotta say that. And then that's clear instructions to Translink and Metro and your neighbors that when it comes to a bigger bridge or a wider road, I know you said it with respect to United Boulevard. You're serious, and then you'll know your degree of seriousness as to whether you're really going to help us with the issues that the region faces as a whole. I can tell you politically, sitting around a Translink and a Metro board, if no one New Westminster simply says, okay, uh, we don't want any more traffic, um, you know, you figure it out somewhere else. We don't want the trucks coming through our neighborhoods, they should go somewhere else. That's going to make it real easy to vote against you. If this just looks like an exercise for New Westminster's benefit and the help of the rest of the region, particularly Surrey, yeah, good luck on that. You'll, you'll have the moral high ground, but you're going to lose. It's only when you get serious about those other options and that you're prepared to take on some of that burden, whether it be through taxes or commitment of your road space, something that may affect you negatively because it's in the benefit of the region, will you be able to say no more capacity for the single occupancy vehicle will do better with what we've got. Now the really good news about this is that that's probably not going to be that hard a thing to do. Because there's something going on out there. It's a little hard to say exactly what it is at this point, but it clear, apparently, is similar to what happened in Vancouver. You saw it in the paper today. You notice that? You picked up the sun for those of you who read it. Did you read that about parking? Developers go into underground parking garages these days around the region, and guess what they see? Empty parking spaces. Now, those are parking spaces that cost them twenty to forty-five thousand dollars or more to build. And believe me, developers do not like to see empty parking spaces that they didn't have to build. It didn't make a difference to whether they were able to sell their product. There are things going on out there that people don't have explanations for as to why young people aren't getting driver's licenses. Not that they're just putting it off; they're just not getting driver's licenses, and they they seem to have this idea that they may be able to get around without an automobile. Now, it may be partly the cost. That's $10,000 a year that they can save. That's, few, that's a big buck. It may mean they can live somewhere else where they want to live. Maybe make all the difference to the price of housing. But they're doing it, and they're doing it in pretty big numbers. And this isn't coming just from Vancouver. There's a series in Sightline Institute. I'm on the board. I've recommended, dude, where are my cars? How do you explain the dropping traffic on I-5? How do you explain the dropping traffic going over the Columbia River crossing? They're thinking about spending billions, big, big, big wide bridge. They say they got to do it. Well, maybe they don't. How do you explain golden ears? What the hell happened there? Why were the numbers wrong? 
Why were they wrong? Why is TransLink having to subsidize that sucker? What's going on here? You can't answer that question. Why are you talking about building a six-lane bridge? Do you have a case to make for spending money you don't have to that could go to something else so that you can build a wider bridge? Government waste, abuse, right? Everyone's against that. Why does that get suspended when it comes to building infrastructure for trucks and cars? So let me get to the final point here, which is if you don't spend that money to build that bridge because you don't have to, what could you use the money for? Well, how about transit? How about fulfilling Surrey's vision? How about light rail down on the floor? How about the D-line service on King George Highway? How about those express buses that Kevin Falcon promised us would be in those lanes on that Fort Bridge? Right? How about the stuff that you've been promised for years that you've been paying for into transit? How about that? Why can TransLink, look, let's say this is a billion dollar bridge. We can assess the planning costs for that sucker to be somewhere in the order of what? A billion dollars? That's a hundred million dollars. Let's cut it in half. Let's say fifty million dollars. So just do the design work. A thousand million. Pardon me? A billion is a thousand million dollars. There you go. Let's just take ten percent of that. Just do the design work. We're not talking about building the bridge. We're talking about designing it. What could you do with that kind of money? That gets you your light rail. Yeah. And that begins to give people over their choices. So that they don't have to get in their cars for everything. And you kind of get more the city. How come in, in an era when TransLink says they don't have money even for taxi savers, or an express bus across the Port Man, or a V-line down the Mono, or anything else in this region? How come they got money for design work for the Port for the Patel Bridge? I'm serious about that question. How come when you say your priorities are to provide a good transit service and you don't have the money, you've got it for this? So there are three questions that need to be asked before I think you get to yours. One, why did you move that motion in 2008 and eliminate the other options that need to be discussed? Two, is New Westminster serious? And are you really prepared to play the regional role of that involved? And then thirdly, if TransMP got no money, why is it spending it on a bridge that we may not need? So here, let me put it to you in four words. No transit, no bridge. We know our priorities. We know where the money has to go first. If you can't spend it on transit, don't spend it on the bridge. No transit, no bridge. Can you join me on that one? Yeah. You guys get to say the no transit part. You guys get to say the no bridge. You with me on this? I know you're Canadians. This is hard to do. No, no, no transit. transit. No. no bridge. One more time. No, no transit. No bridge. Okay, let's see if they hear that. Because they got to hear it up on that tower up on the hill. They got to hear it in Victoria. They got to hear it a few places before it gets set. So it won't be my voice that they're going to hear. It'll be yours. Daniel, thanks for the chance. Appreciate it.